Good morning, church. It's so good to see you. All right, make a big smile and look at your neighbor and say, good morning. And let's stand up and sing together, Victory in Jesus. so good to see each and every one of you guys here this Sunday morning. Uh, hey guys, welcome. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord. I hope you've come this morning prepared to worship him and to sing his praises. But right now, find somebody out there and shake their hand. Go say hello to your neighbor and uh, just introduce yourself if you don't know the person sitting next to you. Amen. As you make your way back to your seat, go ahead and take a seat and let's watch a quick video. I'm Shanda Lee, your women's ministry director. 
we're looking forward to the fall with groups. You've probably seen and heard on our social media channels about groups over the last few weeks. And I'm also pretty sure you're probably asking what kinds of groups are available and how long do I have to commit? In groups ministry, we desire to create groups and environments of different lengths that encourage depth of relationship with God and others. We want to connect people with similar hobbies, goals for connection, and depth of relationship. I've been in many groups over the years, fellowship, service, hobby, study, discipleship, and more. Each has a special place in my heart. Fellowship, service, and hobby groups have helped me find friendships with people that have similar tastes, mission, and hobbies. Study and discipleship groups have challenged me to think and act in my everyday life. One of these groups combined fellowship and study with service. We met with five other couples and our families for a long time. We did a lot of life together. We learned together, we grew together. The six families were all in different seasons when we began. Some had middle school kids, some elementary, some had no kids. As more kids came along, we ranged from newborns to high schoolers. That's a lot of knowledge and experience in one group that we were able to share. We met every single week and through the years, we had people. We had people we could ask questions about faith, about raising kids, about cleaning hacks even, about marriage struggles and just life in general. I sure love that group. Life has taken turns and our season together ended, but God brought more groups into our lives. Keith and I both have had amazing friendships develop out of discipleship groups. I call them my girls and still talk regularly with some of them about life, about God, about everything. Just this week, one called asking for advice and prayer. People are created to be relational. We're designed to be encouraged and challenged by each other to mourn and celebrate together. Groups come in all shapes and sizes. Some might meet once a month, some might meet every week, some will meet long-term, and some will only meet for a semester. There's a place for the kind of connection you've been looking for. For women specifically, we're offering Wednesday night Bible studies at Hickson and Saudi Daisy. And smaller, more intimate discipleship groups are available too. These both help facilitate our instruction in Titus 2, 1 through 8 to mentor and teach other the sound message of Christ. Groups also help open doors for us to wrestle through the question that Jesus asked in Matthew 16, 15, when he said, who do you say I am? In addition, having someone come alongside us and explain the way of God more accurately is what Priscilla and Aquila did for Apollos in Acts 18. Groups allow us to study together. They allow us to have curiosity and freedom to ask, what does that mean? In spite of all the ways of communication, we still live in a disconnected world. Groups can help us develop a greater sense of community. They facilitate friendships, they encourage accountability in our faith walk, and they become opportunities to invite others into this community to see Christ lived out in our everyday running around life. We hope that you'll come along on this journey of group life as we live connected. Check out stuartheights.org or the church app and look for the events tab to let us know what interests you. Amen. Let's stand back up together. Everybody take a deep breath and let it out. We made it to Sunday. And let's turn our attention and focus on what we came here to do this morning is to worship him. Let me pray for us and we'll, and we'll continue to sing. Father God, we thank you for this morning, God, for another opportunity, Lord, to come into your house, to sing your praises, God, to worship you, to study your word, to learn about you. Lord, I thank you for each and every person that's here this morning. God, thank you for this church family, for this body, God, of believers that we can come together and love on each other, God, and just um, express our love towards you in a corporate way. God, for those that are here this morning who are seeking you, God, we give you praise. God, for those who are hurting, who are, are going through a trial, God, we lift them up to you, God. May they find peace in you this morning. God, we just love you and we thank you for all you're going to do this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's sing. Be thou my vision.
Of your generosity, uh, your greatness, and God, whether we uh, can sing what we just sang joyfully, or maybe we need to be talked into a little bit, uh, God, we are grateful that we can say that things are, it's well with our soul because of what you've done. You know, that song talked about the cross, your work on it, your act of forgiveness and mercy and grace that we've been able to receive, not because we've earned it or deserved it, God, but because you I wanted to give it to us. You chose us. And so thank you for doing that. Thank you for allowing us to celebrate that today, for the privilege of living in that throughout this next week and month and year. God, allow us to see other people and their needs and to be able to step forward and to serve them. And God, we are grateful to be together. We're grateful to be able to sing your praises because you are so worthy. God, thank you for setting our souls at peace and at rest even in the midst of all the circumstances of life, the troubles, the challenges, the hurt, the heartache. God, so many things definitely do not get by your notice and you care and you are in the background working your plan just like you always have been. So God, let us trust you more to do those things that you've meant for good in our life, even though right now they don't seem so good. God, we love you and thank you and appreciate all you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus 
sight shall see when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day. Let's pray together. Our Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus to rescue us. Through his completed work on the cross. To redeem us, to purchase us. Lord, we thank you that we can live in this fallen world with the certain assurance of knowing that, that one day you will reconcile all things to yourself. And that while we live in the midst of brokenness and, and suffering and trial, we know that you are present that you are here, that you are at work, that, that you are being purposeful. But that we can, as followers of Jesus, look forward to the promise of eternity with you, and we thank you for that. And so, Lord, as we open your word this morning, we ask you to bring us the encouragement that only your word and your spirit can bring. And may everything that we do today glorify you and honor you, be pointed to you. And Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Let me invite you to take your Bible and open it to Genesis chapter 39, as we move into week three of our uh, study or examination of the life of Joseph, but uh, as we move into this week, we're going to be uh, a little bit of review on what we've covered in the first couple of weeks to get to here as we talk this morning about enduring the slow days of suffering. Enduring the slow days of suffering because as we move rapidly through this text, we've got to be reminded that it took Joseph a little while uh, to get from the beginning of this narrative to the end. We talked about it in the first and second week that it took about 22 years to get from uh, the dreams that Joseph had until the second year of the famine when uh, we see latter, in the latter part of the book of Genesis that some time has gone by. And we can read it in about 22 minutes, but it took him 22 years to get from point A to point B. And there were some slow days in the midst of that. There were some slow days where it didn't look like things were moving maybe at the pace that he thought that they should. And, and so we're going to spend our time this morning in chapter 39 where there's some, certainly some slow days of this narrative. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through and read the text and then we're going to walk through and pull out some observations that we can draw from it and, and some truths that we can glean from the text to hopefully encourage us as we may be enduring trial or suffering even now or as we said in the first week that people at all places in life are either coming out of a trial, they're heading into one or they're in the midst of one right there. 
Because trial and suffering is just a reality of living in a fallen world. And sometimes it comes from a different source. Sometimes we, we talked about that it's not always punitive. Sometimes it comes at the hands of others or the sinful actions of others or the sinful decisions of others. And, and so suffering comes in a variety of means. But in all of those means, they're under God's sovereignty and God is working purposefully in them. And so as we talk about these, these texts, this narrative... I want us to remember the purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is God's revelation of himself to us. It is not primarily God's revelation of Joseph to us. The, the main character of all of the Bible is God. And so as we read this narrative about Joseph, we need to be mindful that Joseph is not the primary character. He's not the main character of his own story. If we read through these texts and we learn about Joseph's character, but we miss God, then we've missed the point. And so I want us to, to be reminded, and maybe a little bit of some mid-course correction as we come into this text, that, that if we come to the end of this series and we know a lot more about Joseph, but not as much about God, then we've missed it. And so as we, as we read this text this morning, I want us to be mindful that we're not just observing everything that we can know about Joseph, but we need to see where is God at work in this text and what are the things that we can learn about him through this. And so as, if we ever read, and particularly in the narrative portions of the Bible, in our reading, if we're ever drawn more to the, to the human characters than we are to God, then we need to sort of pump the brakes there and have a, a bit of a course correction. Here's some questions that you can ask yourself as you read the scripture to make sure that we're on the right course. Uh, some things that we can bring to the text. We can ask the question, what do I learn about God from this text? And so as I read this morning aloud, I want you to be thinking, what do we learn about God from Genesis chapter 39? How is God's character or his, or his holiness or his power or glory on full display in this text? Or how or where does God fit this text into his larger story, his redemptive work of how he's going to reconcile all things to himself? Because Genesis 39 not only lands in the book of Genesis, but it also lands in the full canon of Scripture. So where does this particular text fit in God's story of reconciling all things to himself. And so let's look in Genesis chapter 39 and get an update in this part of the narrative. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. You may want to pay attention to repetitive phrases in this text. That's one of them. Because this text is bookended with this reality that the Lord was with Joseph. And then there's a, a hinge verse in the middle that we're going to spend some time on. But be looking for phrases of repetition. And the Lord was with Joseph. And so he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. And so Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer of his house and all that he owned he put into his charge. And it came about that from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. And so he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him, there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. And now Joseph was handsome in form and in appearance. And it came about that after these events that this master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he's put me in charge of all that he owns. Now there is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? You may want to circle verse 9 or note it in some way. Because there's a hinge verse here that the narrative is taking a turn. So we know that, that 
he's been placed in Potiphar's house. This is the context of the passage, that he's been brought to Egypt by these slave traders, and now he's been purchased by Potiphar, and he's put him to work in his house, and God is blessing him. God is causing all that Potiphar owns to be blessed and to prosper because of God's goodness to Joseph. Not because of Joseph's giftedness, not because of his grand administrative skill. The text is clear that the blessing comes because the Lord is with him. There's causation at work here. And so we see that that things are going well for him, but even in the midst of things going well, pay attention because we might think, oh, well, things are wonderful for Joseph now. Though the reality is he's still a servant. He's not at home. He's owned by another person. So just because the immediacy of his context seems to be going in a good, trending in the right direction, he's still not where he thinks he ought to be. Not where he would prefer to be, I'm sure. And for the next long part of the text, he's still going to be not in his home. He's still going to be not with his family. He's still going to be separated from those that he cares most about. So even if things in the immediacy of the circumstance seem to be going well, there's still some sense of lack and longing for Joseph. But how then could I do this great evil in sin against God? And it came about that as she spoke to Joseph day after day, that he did not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. And now it happened one day that, they, that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household were there inside. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of the household and said to them, see, he has brought in a Hebrew to make sport of us. And he came in to lie with me and, and I screamed. And it came about that when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed that he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. And so she left his garment beside her until his master came home. And then she spoke to him with these words, the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came into me to make sport of me. And it happened that as I raised my voice and screamed that he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now it came about that when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me, that his anger burned. And so Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in jail. And if chapter 39 ends in verse 20, it seems rather hopeless and dire for Joseph. But remember I said that This chapter is bookended with this phrase of God's presence with Joseph. And so even though things are turning a different direction for him in his immediate context, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer didn't supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. In the midst of this trial, we see the consistent presence and faithfulness of God. As he's sold into slavery and purchased by Potiphar and put to work in his home, the The Lord is with him. And not only with him, but at work in and through him. We talked about it in the first week, and we're reminded of it in the second week. We're reminded again about it here in the third week. In the midst of our trial, in the midst of our suffering, God is present. The Lord is with him. We are told very little through the the, the lion's portion of Joseph's narrative much about his emotional state. Now, when we get to the end, spoiler alert, when we get to the end and he's reunited with his brothers, there's much emotion that is talked about. But here in the midst of it, we can only speculate and 
I'd rather not speculate about what's not in the text, but I'd rather focus on what is in the text. And so we don't know much about Joseph's emotional state during this long, slow period of trial. But what we are reminded with certain repetition is God is present. God is at work. Even though the circumstances are horribly difficult, God never abandons him. God is with him. The Lord is with him in Potiphar's house. The Lord is with him in prison. So our context, we're reminded of the the very faithful presence of God to Joseph through the entirety of this text. And so as we're thinking about ways that we can be encouraged, we talked about God's promises to us last week that in the midst of our trial, God is present. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. We've talked about his promises of his presence and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's not that just merely God is with us, but God is at work in us through the indwelling of the Spirit. And so as we think about some principles that we can glean from this text in the longer, slower days of suffering, we need to be reminded ultimately and and predominantly of God's presence in our lives. And then as we learn from some things that Joseph is doing, we still live in that reality that God is present with us. Now you might be thinking, well, Brian, it seems like you're harping on that quite a bit. Yes. Because how many times have you talked with someone who was in the midst of trial and part of their their conversation was feeling like they had been abandoned by God? That's part of what suffering does for us. When we're hurting, we very often feel isolated and alone like nobody has ever felt this way before. Or where is God? Where is God in all this? That fits in part of a, of a humanistic worldview that if, if they very remotely believe that there is a God, he certainly isn't involved in our lives. But that's not the God of the Bible. That's not a biblical worldview. It says God not only created the world, but God is actively involved in it. In Colossians chapter 1, all things were made by him and for him and through him, and in him all things hold together, that God is wonderfully active in his creation. And so the goal, one of the goals of this series in general is for believers who are currently enduring trial to be encouraged. And what wonderful encouragement is to know that in the midst of our suffering and trial and pain, God has not abandoned us. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, and and very often we wish it would just hurry up and finish. But to know that the God of the universe is intimately and actively involved in our lives. Grand and wonderful encouragement. And so I want us to talk in that context of God's presence in us, how then we engage in days of the slow enduring of trial. Because there are things and and times we may be tempted to, to do maybe not the right things. And one lesson that we can learn from Joseph is doing the right things in the midst of difficulty and trial. If we go back and look in the beginning of the narrative, Joseph gave a bad report about his brothers. It doesn't say anything that he fabricated it. It doesn't say that he made it up. The more we learn about the brothers, it seems like it's probably true. They don't seem to be like the best brothers ever. And so when he comes back to give a report about his his brothers to his father, he gave a bad report and they hated him for it. And and then, remember, they hated him, then they hated him even some more, and then they even hated him more. They don't seem to be the kind of guys that you would give a good report about. So we've got no reason to believe that Joseph fabricated any part of the report. He was just trying to do what his father told him and and, and be obedient. Seems like he was doing the right thing. Here in this text, he's sold into Potiphar's house and God blesses him and, and, and God blesses the Egyptian's house on the account of Joseph. And, 
and it seems like he's striving to do the right thing. And then when he's put into a potentially compromised situation, look at the offense that he takes at the potential of offending God. So in his doing the right things, it ended up with him being in a pit, then sold into slavery, and now in Potiphar's house, and the right things want to eventually lead him into prison. Two things that we can see from that. Number two in your outline, sometimes doing the right thing is rewarded. The more I pondered this outline, the more I disliked the wording of point two and three. The bulletins were printed and the PowerPoint was made. So we're going to edit on the fly. I encourage you to come back at 11 and see what it looks like after two more times. Because it implies that, that A plus B equals reward. From the outside looking in, it looks like Joseph's good deeds equaled good things from God. And that's very often the way that we think. If I do this good thing, then God now somehow owes me. I don't want to give that impression at all. God's blessing Joseph, not because Joseph's earned it or deserves it, but because God is good and God is at work. And so scratch out point two and make that wording better. And if you come up with something really good, text me before 10 o'clock. But it looks like, from the outside looking in, Joseph's doing the right thing and good things are happening. But I say that to lead us into the second point, point three. Sometimes doing the right thing gets rejected. Because we might be tempted... To think all Joseph's trying to do is honor God and it ends up with him being in prison. So at that point, what's the point? If something bad's going to happen when I do good, what's the point in doing good? I want us to, I want us to catch the weight of what Joseph says in verse 9. How in the world could I even consider engaging in this evil act and sinning against God? Several of the commentators that I read looking at that text use the word absurdity. Joseph thinks, what you're asking me to do is absurd. What you're inviting me to do is absurd. Not only would I be offending my, my master talking about Potiphar, but how in the world would you expect me to do, engage in this evil act and to, and to sin against God? What I want us to see in this text is sometimes the best motive and the best action still end up in trial. Because very often we have a a very functional equilibrium with God in our expectations. If I do this right thing with this right motive, then therefore I've got to have the right comfortable outcome. And, and if that outcome doesn't come, then certainly either I messed up somewhere in this A plus B because A plus B should equal comfort, but now A plus B equals me still going to prison. That doesn't seem right. So either I did something wrong or God's not who he says he is. Do you see the flaw in the thinking? And so if right deed plus right motive must always equal comfort or therefore then God really isn't good... I'm not suggesting for a moment that is a right thought, but I am suggesting for a moment that very often followers of Jesus have it. Right motive. How in the world do you think I could sin against my master and against God? Right action. Day after day after day after day, he would not listen to her still ended up in prison because of a false accusation. 
So what do we take from that in this context of, of how, do, how are we to be encouraged about the slow days of suffering? That we don't do the right things to merely get good from God. That's idolatry. That's some sort of earned gift benefit transaction. If I do this and I do this with the right motive, well, there's the question, is my motive correct? Then therefore God is now obligated to give me this thing that is comfort. I don't believe that's a biblical view of suffering. And I don't ultimately think that's a very biblical view of God. Because it doesn't seem to be what God is doing here in Genesis chapter 39. Where Joseph, striving to honor God, does the right thing and contextually still ends up bringing him difficult immediate circumstances. Because he goes from the favored servant in Potiphar's home to now the, what will ultimately be the, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're the jailer's favorite prisoner, you're still a prisoner. Let, let's not lose the context there. God's still with him. God still gives him favor, but his context changes and takes a step down, if you will. So then how do, we, how do we deal with this? Remember the whole point of the Bible is so that we learn about who God is. It's God's revelation of himself to us. It's how we learn God's character. It's how we see God's glory. And so when we think, okay, well now what is God doing here? God is still what? God is still with him. God is still present. God is still at work. We're going, if, if you know the rest of the narrative, this makes perfect sense. Because he goes to prison and he's going to get forgotten by some important people. Isn't that encouraging? But in a little bit, his ability to interpret dreams is going to catch the ear and the eye of Pharaoh. Which may or may not have happened if he was simply serving successfully in Potiphar's house, because Potiphar's probably going to keep him right there. But God, working by being present and at work, continues to maneuver circumstances to get Joseph in front of the right people so that he can ultimately get to chapter 45 through 50. And it's easier for us because we know the rest of this narrative, but here's the, here's the, the hinge The same God that is at work in Genesis 37 is the same God that is at work in Genesis chapter 50. His character doesn't change in those 13 verses. His presence doesn't change in those 13 verses. His intent, his glory, his goodness, his faithfulness, all of those things, still very present, still very consistent from Genesis 1 all the way to the Revelation. So when we think about these realities of us, of how we engage in the midst of our trial, we recognize that sometimes the math won't work because sometimes doing the right thing is going to be rewarded by those around us and sometimes those things are going to be rejected by all those around us. But at all times, our behavior and our motive must be God-honoring. All of these times, all of these times, Our behavior and our motivation must be God-honoring. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? In the midst of trial... In the midst of difficulty and suffering... If left to our own way of thinking, we will look for the place of greatest ease. But it appears that Joseph in chapter 39 
has not lost focus on the sovereign God of the universe. Instead of looking at his circumstances, instead of looking for an opportunity, rather his heart, his desire is that he would bring honor to God by not sinning against him. Joseph's great desire is to obey and honor God in his action. Paul writes it this way in Colossians chapter 3, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as to the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So it's not just that Joseph happened to be serving Potiphar. Joseph is ultimately serving God. And whether that comes with benefit or whether that comes with challenge, his heart, his desire is still to honor God. So when we're in the midst of our trial, when we're in the midst of our difficulty, we recognize that at all times our attitudes, our behavior, our motive needs to be focused on God, honoring to God, recognizing God's work, recognizing God's sovereignty because this is the reality of our suffering at all times. It is not only an opportunity for us to honor God, but at all times it is under God's sovereign care. And that's the part that really messes with us mentally and emotionally sometimes because we want this to always work out in the way that we understand it. If God is good and God only does good things, then how come that equals sometimes me suffering? All of these things happen under God's sovereignty. Chapter 39, verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph. So, purpose word. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful or prosperous man. Verse 3. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 2, the Lord is with him, caused all things to prosper. Verse 3, the Lord is with him. And even Potiphar notices that God causes everything he does to prosper. It doesn't say that he recognized Joseph's ability and praised Joseph. What does it say? Potiphar recognizes that God causes this blessing. Now, it doesn't say in this text that Potiphar becomes a God worshiper. It just says he recognizes that there's a, there seems to be a difference in Joseph's God and mine. Joseph's God causes this to happen. And so, therefore, Joseph found favor in his sight. Well, of course. The better your God is to you, the better my house turns out to be. So, I'm all for that. One commentator brought this point out, that when the report comes to Potiphar about what his wife accused Joseph of doing, it would have been within his right to have him killed, but he didn't. He only threw him in prison. There still is some sense of favor that's being shown even via Potiphar. So God's sovereignty at work, the Lord is with him. Causation causes everything that he touches to be blessed. End of the text. His circumstances change. His location changes. God's presence still there. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. Same word. The Lord was with Joseph. Same word. Extend, the Lord extended kindness to him. And gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. God did this. It doesn't say that the chief jailer just gave him favor. No, the Lord, there's causation in the Lord's action here. He's with him and God extends him kindness. And God causes the jailer to look upon him <coughs> excuse me, with favor. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail. So that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The jailer did nothing to supervise under anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Same word as in verses 2 and 3. 
causation. All of the things that are happening to Joseph happened under God's sovereign care. None of it caught him off guard, but it was all purposeful. So taking these and put this in our current context. I readily admit these truths may not immediately lessen your sense of trial. In all of this text, from chapter 37 all the way to the end of of Genesis, there's still trial. If you are right now in the midst of trial, I recognize that none of these truths from 8.30 until now, none of these things have either changed your condition, changed your circumstance, or really necessarily made anything quote-unquote better. But the goal of this whole series is for us to be reminded that in the midst of our trial, God has not abandoned us. In the midst of our trial, God is still good. In the midst of our difficulty, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our suffering, God is still with us. He has promised us he will never leave us or will he forsake us. He has given us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, it's to your benefit that I go away because if I don't go away, then the helper won't come. Who will not only be with you, but will be in you. And as we look at this particular part of Joseph's life, two people give him great blessing because the Lord caused it. But he still finds himself in prison. So his circumstances really didn't change. They actually got a little bit worse. To be the favorite prisoner, you're still in prison. But God is with him. And God is at work. And it's easy for us to read all the way to the end of Genesis and see how it all works out. And it's wonderful because we know the end of the narrative and how God brings all these things to reconciliation and he wraps up all the loose ends and he puts a bow on it and it all works out perfectly. But in the midst of my trial this morning, I still hurt. And I'm still frustrated. And I still feel alone. I still feel isolated. All these things... And I pray that this morning the text screams to us, God is with us. He has not abandoned us. He has not abandoned you. Your circumstances may improve or they may deteriorate. God is still God. And he's still good. He's still at work. And we still live in a broken world. David sang this morning, what a day that will be. I was reminded even this weekend, one of my daughter's best friends lost her mom this weekend. I was reminded of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus looking around at the grieving and the wailing and the mourning that all of this happened because someone had died. And two different times in that text, I've talked about this before, two different times in that text it says Jesus was moved with compassion. I heard D.A. Carson give a much better explanation of that. He said that's a terrible translation of that verse. It says Jesus was outraged. It's, there, it's there's, a, there's a guttural element to that word. It's as if Jesus looks at all of what's around him, and it's this, this, ugh. It's not supposed to be this way. 
He's looking at all of the people who are weeping and grieving because their brother has died, their friend has died, their, their village mate has died, and there's mourning. The people have come to be with them at the tomb, and Jesus looks and he weeps because it's not supposed to be this way. And it's in this context that he asked the sister, do you believe that your brother will live again? And she says, I believe that in the resurrection he'll live again. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. There will be one day when everything is made right. And we will not suffer and we will not have trial. And we will not hurt. What a day, a glorious day that will be. But until that day comes, God has not left us alone. God has not abandoned us. God has not taken his hands off of this world. Nothing happens in this world that is apart from his sovereignty. Abraham Kuyper said it this way, that there's not one square inch in this universe that God does not declare mine. And he has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. But he is present and he is good and we can rest in him. So what do we do in the midst of our trial? We rest in God's presence He's with us. We rest in his presence. We trust in his work. We trust in his character. We listen more to what the text of the scripture tells us about who God is rather than the the fickle emotions that we have. Because the same God that is at work in Genesis 37 and 39 and through this whole text, is the same God as that is at work in your life this morning. He has not changed. He has not changed. And so as we come to a conclusion of, of this text, what do we do? We rest in him. So this morning, if you're in the midst of trial, I want to invite you to rest in him. And I have become a big fan of praying this way. Lord, you and I both know. Lord, you and I both know I'm tired. You and I both know I don't get this. You and I both know I don't like it. But I trust you. And I want to rest in you. He's present. He's in us. And he's given us the benefit of the church. We've been watching these videos about groups. Not only has God given you his presence, God's also given you his people. So may we as his followers, as Jesus' followers, may we bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. I've gone to Honduras four times. Two different times I've taken the same picture with different sons. The first time Campbell and I went to Honduras together, he was carrying a cooler or he was, he was helping a little boy carry a cooler. And the little boy was on one end and Campbell was on the other because it was too heavy for the little boy to carry by himself. So Campbell went up, picked on one side, and off they went. So I got a picture of that. Just a couple months ago, a little girl was trying to carry a cooler by herself, and Graham went over and picked up the other side of it and walked off. There they go. I got a picture of that. So I can put those pictures beside one another. I thought that's a picture of the church. When we're in the midst of trial, when we're in the midst of suffering, Our cooler is too heavy to carry by ourselves. We need somebody to pick up the other end. To just be there. 
Not necessarily have words, but just to be. Job's friends did wonderfully till they started to talk. When they just came and sat with him on the ash heap. You don't have to have fancy words. Sometimes no words are better. Actually, I would encourage you to use fewer. But just to be. So how today can we let someone pick up the other end of our cooler or how can we pick up somebody else's? Just by being his people. So rest in his presence, trust in his work and and enjoy the benefit that we have of being his people. And let's love each other well until he comes. Let's pray. Lord, we don't like trial. I don't. I would much rather be comfortable and hurt. But I thank you that regardless of where we are, that you are present, you are at work, that you are good, that you are faithful, that you've given us the benefit of the church. And Lord, I pray that this morning, above all things, that you've been glorified, that you've been blessed, that you've been honored, that you've been pleased. And Lord, secondly, that your people have been encouraged And that those who are suffering right now, that they are keenly aware of your presence. Lord, for those who may not be enduring some sort of trial right now, Lord, help us to look for ways to bear one another's burdens. And in all of these things, may you be glorified. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Another day, great day of being together. We have so many things going on. Things kicking off tonight. Things kicking off on Wednesday nights. And so I want to direct you to your bulletin if you're here in person or the church app and or the website, especially the tab that has the events Check all those throughout the week and the next couple months just to make sure you're in the loop. A great opportunity that we have to give, uh, and we have a lot throughout the years, but we have another one that we've done before. I'm going to have you watch this video. Give us the details of that. What a great statement. You're sending more than shoes. You're sending hope. So thank you to those of you who have already brought in shoes. There are places that you can put those in the lobby and we'll be collecting those through the rest of August. We have prayed a lot today, but let's pray one more time. We need it.
right? We need it. It's just, it's just telling God that we need him and we can't do things on our own. So let's pray one more time to be dismissed today. God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this day. Thank you for loving us so well that you would bring us here, that you would allow us to participate in worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, thank you for your kindness that you would allow us to do that. And God, thank you for your presence that even when we feel alone, God, we know because of what your word says that you're there. You're there, you're carrying us, you're helping us. And God, you also bring other people into our lives to carry our cooler, to carry our burdens, to help and encourage us in all ways and at all times. God, let us to see that more this week, be more aware of it, and let us also be more aware of opportunities to help others and bear their burdens this week too. God, we love you and thank you and pray you give us a great rest of our soul.